we are going to get into some ideas about power structures and the theories behind new monarchies. Uh, we're going to be looking at a variety of different nations in my next video about kind of what was the status of a lot of nations politically at this time. And we're going to see some of the actions and some of the theories behind it. And really the big idea that, that I want you to understand and keep in the back of your mind is this idea of what can nations do and what will they do in order to centralize and strengthen the power of the federal government. So uh, once again, the main influence as the early part of the Renaissance was getting through is Machiavelli. We've talked about him in my videos before. Uh, his idea of you have to have a strong central power. The prince needs to have all the power. The prince needs to do whatever he, he can to get things done. It might be considered dishonest. It might be scary. He might be feared rather than loved. And that's okay. And so when we look at that, the big theme is that idea of let's centralize power and what can we do to make the government stronger? All right. And one of the great examples uh, that we see here is the changing of the dynamic between the power of church and state. The fact of the matter is, and we're going to talk about this a lot when we get into our next section, which uh, in the Reformation, is throughout the Middle Ages, the popes were the ultimate power. They were involved in everyday affairs. They were involved in the monarchies. And we're getting to the point now that nations are getting out of feudalism. They're developing central identities and they want more power. And so the idea is that they're looking to change that. And what we're going to see here are kind of these smart balances of give a little, get a little. So like, let me give you a great example in Spain. So in Spain, they allow, particularly under Isabella and Ferdinand, they allow the Inquisition to do what they need to do in both spreading the religion as well as going against um, those who that they felt were dangerous to the religion, particularly Muslims and Jewish people. But in this particular case, by allowing the Inquisition to do what they did, the Spanish monarchs get the right to appoint clergy and the promise of the popes to not really be involved in secular matters. So when the king and queen make a ruling about just non-religious stuff, the popes are going to stay out of the way. Huge deal. Another great example is the Concordat of Bologna, which was made between King Francis I, that guy there on the left of France, and Pope Leo X. And so what we have here is that King Francis I basically allows and doesn't try to get any cut of the revenue of the Catholic Church. Like he's not going to tax the Catholic Church at all. He's not going to ask the Catholic Church to share some of the revenue they make from the various land ownings and stuff that they have in France in exchange for, once again, the ability to nominate all church leaders and that those leaders actually, before they ever communicate anything with the Pope, they have to communicate it to the king first. So here we go. We're getting these steps in which the monarchs are expressing greater power um, over their subjects, less interference from the Pope and the big theme of the Renaissance is the decreasing power of the popes and the increasing power of the monarchs. So this is what we have here. So what else do they do things to control? And really it's money. It's finding way to control the money and to limit nobles. Because if we go back to feudalism, it was these wealthy nobles that often caused problems for the crown. So one of the big things is we have the development of national tax systems. Okay. Something called the alcohol. Uh, Al Kabala in Spain, the towel or tail system in France, and the taxing of the gentry there, as you see in England. And the idea here is that when you look at the Al Kabala and the tally system, they are taxes on the exchange of land. So when land is bought and sold in both France and Spain, there is a tax on that that goes to the federal government. And this is really, really important because this allows a revenue stream now for the government. So when the government makes more money, they can do things. This also limits the powers of nobles because they have to watch about buying and selling of too much land because they're going to get tagged for taxes. Uh, if you see here in Spain, they have a group of people called the Corregidores, And in France, you have the bailiffs who 
their job is to collect these taxes. And it starts that their jobs go from collecting these taxes to slowly but surely enforcing other laws. So kind of a nationalized police system. So that is pretty important. Um, and these are pretty effective. Just to give you an idea, the tail system or tail system was so effective in France that they made so much money that the French crown was actually able to buy. So they didn't have to fight for, they didn't have to conquer, but they bought the provinces of Burgundy, Anjou, Provence, and Maine. So four provinces and four pretty significant, particularly Burgundy, Anjou, and Provence. Maine is Provence, Maine. I mean, they're all really important areas of France today, and they were able to buy them using this revenue. So that was pretty important, super effective. And in England, they also did something under Henry VII um, by taxing the gentry. So the gentry, okay, this is a class of prosperous families. Some made money through commercial ventures. Some made money through land. Um, many of them were kind of titled people. And again, it's the same thing. You tax them, gives you revenue, kind of keeps them in check because they're not gaining as much revenue as you, which means they can't spend as much money. Um, and once again, here you have justices of the peace who are going to enforce that and then later on enforce other laws. So we see how government control is getting increased at this time. You see how they're gaining more power from the popes. And there's some philosophies that are going to go behind this that will help drive these strong central monarchs. Okay, and so we're going to have some theorists that come out. Um, now, there will be some contending theorists with them that we'll be talking about later on in something known as the Enlightenment. But here during this uh, age of absolute monarchs or the new monarchs, we're going to see these theories really focus on centralized control by the federal government. So the first one we have here is Jean Bodin. Uh, Jean Bodin lived from 1530 to 1596 in France. He wrote a variety of books on law, government, and religion. And one of the big things that he advocated, which is going to be a huge deal, and by the way, this is something that a lot of people still believe today, um, the divine right of kings. Now, it's not as much kings, but it's also leaders. Many people feel that people who are, whether they're elected or appointed to lead, in many ways are appointed by God, that they wouldn't have those positions if God wouldn't want them to have those positions. And that's a huge deal. Um, we know in, in England, not in, just in England, I'm sorry, in Europe, whether it was all Catholic Europe or with the Catholic and Protestant Europe, uh, the power of religion was huge. And so the divine right of kings was a big way in which kings made it to be understood that just they are in charge. And they are in charge because God has ordained it so. And that goes to the next point underneath there, the sovereignty of rule is indivisible, that there is no, like we have in the United States here, separation of powers. That's not how this works. It is a single ruler. They have all of the power and their job is to keep the peace and they do it through the issuance of laws and the carrying out of laws. Hence those, you know, corregidors and the bailiffs and the justices of the peace and that stuff. And in the end, that rulers do not need the consent of people, according to Bodine, because of the divine right of kings, the sovereignty of, of rule being indivisible, you do not need that. Now, it sounds pretty bleak and pretty stark, but, you know, at the time, it was something that was very, very much believed. But he also had, Bodine had some really interesting ideas. Um, one was on education, is he is an early advocate of education for all. That's going to come out later, because he felt that education... Um, would better a country. So, and that's something we'll be talking about a lot. But it's his religious writings that were really interesting. Uh, he wrote a book here, The uh, Colloquium of the Seven About the Secrets of the Sublime. And what this was, was he was really big about trying to figure out what is the true religion of the world. He felt that it was definitely a monotheistic religion. But the question is, well, which one? And so he wrote this really interesting book in which he had seven representatives of a variety of religions and philosophies come together in Venice to debate their claims as to what is the true religion. And so he had represented Judaism, Catholicism, Calvinism, Lutherism, Islam. He also had a religious skeptic and a natural philosopher. He himself, Bodine, was a Catholic, but it was really interesting. And, and they have, everybody gets to lay out their, their, their cases and they debate back and forth in the book. It's really, really interesting. And in the end, and this is the part that I find really fascinating, especially for the time, in the end, they basically all agree to disagree. 
and all understand that each person feels that they believe in their own true and, and what they believe in is their own true religion. And it's okay. And that they actually depart as friends. Not surprisingly, kind of more orthodox people on all sides of these types of religions were not particularly fond of this book, got them in a little bit of trouble. But it, this concept was pretty revolutionary at the time. And, and I think it's pretty cool. Um, he also believed in the patriarchal role of the family, strong central leadership from men. Um, and that's really important to the fabric of society. We've talked about that a little already. We'll continue to talk about it in the future. So no real surprises on that one. But the religion one I thought was, was really interesting. Another pretty influential guy here is Hugo Groetius. Uh, he is from the Netherlands, uh, really big on law and rights. He lived from 1583 to 1645. Pretty, I mean, talk about an intelligent guy. This guy went to college when he was 11, graduated with a doctorate in law, from the University of Orléans at the age of 15. Um, wrote about a lot of things, was very passionate about religion. Um, he actually got in trouble over debating religion in which he was sentenced to a life uh, imprisonment in jail. Uh, but he was able to somehow, and I'm not exactly sure how, uh, I'm probably gonna look that up a little bit more, but he was able to evidently escape prison and flee to France. And he spent much of the rest of his life in France and Sweden in which he was, um, he was free. So he was really big on international law and that not only do we need laws that govern, um, you know, internally, but we need laws that govern nations in their interactions with others. The big influence here is the 30 Years' War. We're going to be talking about the 30 Years' War. I have a whole video on it. Um, but basically, this war was awful. Um, it will be the largest war in Europe death-wise until World War I. Yes, bigger than the Napoleonic Wars. It was absolutely devastating. And for Grotius, he really felt that war is, in general, unnecessary. And that the horrors that happen, it needs to be stopped. And so nations need to come together and develop rules of engagement and laws to determine how nations will interact with one another. And if you focus on the rule of law rather than just military engagement, the odds of these big wars from happening would go away. Um, he also really advocated for the humane treatment of civilians. And we'll talk about that when we talk about some wars because, you know, the treatment of civilians and these war crimes are just horrible. And he felt that something needed to be done about that as well. And when he breaks it down, he really feels that war should only happen in defense, uh, what he calls reparation of injury and punishment. Uh, basically, that war must be justified in a rational way and in many cases should be the, the, last, the, the last option. Uh, it's really influential today. Uh, a lot of the organizations who are out there, uh, international organizations, whether eventually it was the League of Nations or the United Nations, um, a lot of their kind of beliefs and structure come from uh, Hugo Grotius here. So pretty interesting. He also has this idea of innate rights. And this is really important. This is going to be a big theme in the Enlightenment when we get there, but I'm going to introduce it now, that basically the basic concept of innate rights is that you are born as a person, therefore you have rights. Those rights do not have to be given of you, you given to you. They are um, there because you're a human and the government does have the responsibility to take care of them. A lot of them were property based that you have what is yours is yours, that no one should be able to take it from you for any reason whatsoever. Um, that government should have reparations for wrongs that are done to people, whether this is money, whether this is changing laws or whatever. If people are wronged, it is up to the government to take care of it. Um, and he has some ideas, early ideas of the social contract. Unlike uh, Jean Baudin, he feels that people should have the right to choose what form of government ran them. Now, he's writing because uh, during the time that he's writing, you're starting to get some ideas of like republics and stuff like that. And some republics existed like down in like Florence and stuff like that. Um, so his idea was that people should have the right to choose their government. But once that government is, cho is chosen, um, they cannot punish the ruler. They should not 
overthrow the ruler, over, overthrow the ruler. Like once it's done, it's done. Um, and he really feels that leaders should govern by rational law and ethics. So let's back it up a little bit. Whereas you have a, um, where you have the ideas of say Machiavelli, that ethics are not really necessary here. You are seeing that. So we're going to, and, and that's something big that we're going to be talking about as we get into the enlightenment later on. All right, and our final guy, and probably one of the biggest and most influential one was uh, Thomas Hobbes from England. He lived from 1588 to 1679. His big works are Leviathan and the Elements of Law. He was really influenced a lot by traveling around. Um, he visited continental Europe in the early 1600s. He came across the works of guys like Kepler and Galileo, and it really, and he also met Francis Bacon. Um, this really got him this dedication to learning as well as the approach to his philosophy is that he understood that meanings of words were really important that he, when he, and he looks at a lot of government and politics, but he's going to approach it from like a geometric and mechanical type of view. Um, so you have a lot of influence in science on his writing. And so what were his core ideas? Well, he was really big on a social contract. He did believe in the social contract um, in the sense that people, the government is there and should be there to protect people. And people have a responsibility to follow the government. Okay. Now, he does believe in the divine right, and he does believe in undivided sovereignty, and I've talked about this already. However, let me tell you why. He basically feels that the only way to have peace and safety and avoiding things like a civil war. Now, he's going to live through the English Civil War, so we see the influence here, which was pretty brutal. Because war is kind of natural to humans that we need to have these things, particularly undivided sovereignty so that we don't have war. Okay. Um, peace and safety were his biggest things. He felt that when it comes to the federal government, that the federal government needs to provide peace and safety for all its citizens. And unfortunately human nature leans toward war that human nature leans toward conflict. And so in order for this to work, you have to have an unaccountable sovereign, that there is nothing that anybody can do to the sovereign. The sovereign needs complete supremacy in law, economics, and war. Because he feels liberty invites war. Liberty invites contract, uh, conflict. When you get too many people doing whatever they want, it causes a problem. You know, might ask yourself, well, then what prevents a lord, a, a lord or a king from being a, like, despot, from being a, a, you know, a modern day dictator? Okay. And it's interesting because he has a great quote and he says, without peace, humans live in continual fear and danger of violent death. What life they have is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So what he's saying is, is that it's strong central rulers that prevent this conflict, right? And so the deal is, if the ruler doesn't do enough to protect people and make them feel safe, that will lead people to no longer obeying him and ultimately will lead to a civil conflict. And so the idea is that rulers in general will do the right thing by their people so as not to get into something like the English Civil War. The interesting thing, so the English Civil War, which we haven't talked a ton about yet, um, the English Civil War was the forces of parliament versus the forces of the monarchy. So when the parliamentarians won the English Civil War, he actually had to go in a little bit of hiding for a little bit of while. Um, but then when the monarchy got restored after the death of um, Oliver Cromwell, he was kind of okay again. But this was really, really powerful. This idea of the unaccountable uh, sovereign had huge influence moving on. And we're going to see how that all went into, 
into processes in my next video. Okay. So hopefully you guys got a little something out of this. You understand some of the themes and theories that we have moving forward and I'll see everybody soon.